Good morning, all. We have the quorum. Uh, Good morning. Yes. Madam Chair. Yes. Yes. Alrighty. <clears throat> Oops. Good morning. It is now ten oh seven, and I am calling this May meeting of the Social Equity Council to order. Um, at this time, I'll call the roll. Marilyn Alvario, Ramona Royo, Corey Betts. Present. I am here. Andrea Coomer, Fabian Durango, Avery Gaddis. Here. Sabira Gordon. Here. Michael Jefferson. Here. David Lehman. Here. Ojala Naeem, Mark Pelka. Hi, good morning, Madam Chair. Mark Pelka here, of Office of Policy Management. Thank you. Christine Shaw. I see her. <laughs> Present. Thank How do we you. all learn to read lips by now? <laughs> Ed Shirley. Here. Kelly Valeries. And Kevin Walton. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Good morning, everyone. The council has a lot to cover today, including presentations by UConn, as well as Camillo Communication, as we consider a vendor for our marketing efforts. An update on the RFP for the accelerator consideration of the workforce development plan review process, a reconsideration of last month's recommendation from the policy committee to remove the tax return requirement for non-social equity applicant backers, and a review of the SEC ethics statement. We'll also go into executive session to discuss a personnel matter. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few things. Um, as was shared with this council last week, we've received more than 5,000 applications for various cannabis licenses with social equity applications outpacing those of non-social equity applicants in many license types. We've also exceeded our expectations in terms of social equity applicant cultivator applications. I wanna thank the members of this council, our interim executive director, Ginny Ray Clay and her team, drug control director, Rod Marriott and his team and the many community partners who helped us get out the message and share information on the cannabis program particularly our, our, our outreach committee co-chairs, Sabira Gordon and Marilyn Alvario, as well as the members of that committee. Many states have struggled with engaging equity applicants at the onset of their programs. So while I recognize the app, these applications still must be approved, the numbers are worth noting. We're aware of the concerns regarding significant numbers of applications being submitted by the same company or parties. Applicants may apply multiple times for multiple licenses and license types, as long as they pay the fee for each application submitted. DCP will not award a license to any applicant selected through the lottery that already has two or more licenses of the same type or category, or to any applicant that includes a backer that has managerial control of two or more licensees of the same type or category, or is a backer of two or more licensees of the same type or category. We're all aware of the money-making potential of this industry. We also know the intent of the legislators who fought for equity in this space. Those who seek to corner the market absent a commitment to equity are not only ignoring the will of legislators, advocates, and this council, they are turning a blind eye to decades of criminalization of people of color. I also want to address some of the concerns raising the regarding, regarding the lottery itself, specifically that it's inequitable. To be clear, the lottery process was part of the legislation passed. Neither this council nor DCP have the authority or ability to do away with the lottery process. So any concerns in that regard should be raised with the legislators. In terms of next steps, once the, app, once the application window closes, a third party will randomly select numbers based on a double blind algorithm. Once the numbers are selected, social equity applicants will be sent to Cone Resnick for review and they will present the results of that review to the council. The review process will take at least a few weeks so applicants will not be notified immediately of their status. Council members will undoubtedly hear from applicants asking about their status. So I ask that both applicants be patient and that my council colleagues refer any questions to Director Clay. 
In addition, I'm reiterating once again that the Social Equity Council has no involvement whatsoever with the medical marijuana program. So comments and questions brought to this council regarding medical marijuana purchased from a, produce, purchased from a producer are misplaced. I encourage those to submit a formal complaint to DCP via dcp.mmp at ct.gov. Despite the many comments we hear on a monthly basis, there have only been a handful of formal complaints submitted and the department cannot investigate those concerns without the details of those experiences. Finally, as we discuss the tax return issue, I wanted to provide some clarity around its impetus. As applicants began their due diligence to pursue their licenses, many found that potential backers were reluctant to provide their tax returns for various reasons. Those challenges were voiced to both members of this council and the SEC director. Given that this council exists to facilitate entry into the market for social equity applicants, we aim to remove the barriers that are brought to our attention and within our authority. While tax returns are necessary for social equity applicants because income is among the criteria outlined in the statute, that same evidentiary information is not required by law for backers and the requirement of tax returns from backers is not a standard practice among states. Further, the council will still require tax returns of any related businesses, proof of contribution and financial agreements to verify ownership and control. We also wanted to ensure that a change of course would not impede DCP's application process. So the policy committee chair communicated with the drug control division to assess the implications of removing that requirement. The drug control decision did, division did not take a position either way on the requirement as that's not their role. The division did affirm that the removal of the requirement would not significantly impact the application process and any implications otherwise are misinformed. There are countless people, members of this council, members of the DCD, DCP and SEC teams and community members who are devoting countless hours to stand up this program and promote equity in the space. As I observe their commitment, I'm reminded of President Roosevelt's quote about the man in the arena, which I'll paraphrase a bit for inclusivity. It's not the critic who counts, not the one who points out how one stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the one who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who spends themselves in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of achievement, and who at worst, if they fail, fail while daring greatly. This legislation was not perfect and the process has not been without challenges. The systemic conditions that have marginalized and disadvantaged people of color cannot be undone in one fell swoop or with one bill. We're doing our very best within the parameters of the legislation to address the decades long impact of the war on drugs, which was a war on black and brown communities. And I'm proud to stand with the members of this council, the SEC, DCD, and DCP teams, because I know their dedication and I know their integrity. I wanna thank everyone who's been, who has been and continues to be in this arena. And please know how much you're appreciated. With that, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the minutes of the April meeting. So moved. Second. Is there a, is there a second? I second it. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, great. Um, now we'll turn to Director Clay for her report. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, my camera's a little dark. I've been trying to adjust to get a little more light, but it's not working, so we're gonna move on. Um, Paige, do I have the ability to share my screen? You do. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, excellent. I always have a little trouble getting 
getting this to go. Okay, so good morning members of the council and members of the public. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Ginny Ray Clay, the Interim Executive Director of the Social Equity Council. And I submit the following report for uh, the month of May. So I want to welcome our two newest Social Equity Council staff members. We have Crystal Crenshaw Morris, Crystal is joining us from the Department of Agriculture. Crystal, if you could just say good morning. Crystal is our administrative assistant. And our communications and legislative program manager, Christina Diamond, is also with us. And Christina joins us from the Connecticut Dental Association. Um, they've been doing a great job. They've been here a week, and so we baptized them by fire. Um, they're here today, so I think that means that they're going to stay. Um, we are inter uh, preparing to review applications. So we had 56 applicants for the associate accountant position and 22 of those applicants um, met the preferred qualifications. So we're in the process of reviewing those 22 applications and then we will whittle that down to a reasonable number um, to conduct interviews within the next two weeks. Both the fiscal administrative officer and the brand director position have been approved and we plan to post those um, in May. The work plan update. So the social equity application uh, verification and review process is underway. Cone Resnick is in the process of reviewing 149s and equity joint venture applicants. Um, the marketing and outreach, and we'll have a little bit more information on this, but marketing and outreach RFP complete. Today, you will have a presentation from Camelo Communications um, to, to, um, to confirm or to approve them to go forward. The, I want to thank the committee. It was a pleasure working with Sabira, Andrea, and Marilyn to come up with uh, this recommendation for the council. The accelerator program RFP has been completed. We are in waiting OPM's approval so that we may post it. So the original schedule that we had uh, for posting the RFP on the week of the 11th of April, uh, we're going to revise that as soon as we receive the approvals from OPM. Low interest loan program is in development. We're currently, and this takes time, so we, we've been working with the Department of Economic and Community Development and the Policy Committee of the Council to put this program together. Bylaws, policies, and procedures. Our attorney, Colma Matreve, is in the process of drafting the bylaws and working with the governance and the policy committees of the council um, to get them completed. Everyone um, on the council received an ethics statement for your review. And I don't know if anyone has comments for that. If you want to make those comments now, um, we, can, we can hear those comments. Otherwise, the ethics statement will be posted properly. Okay, we've begun interagency meetings. Our first meeting was with the Department on Banking and with Commissioner George Perez. I want to thank him for joining us at that meeting. Um, the Banking Commission, I mean, sorry, the Banking Department supports the Safe Banking Act. And so I would like to write a letter in support of the Safe Banking Act, which will allow cannabis businesses to bank with federally uh, chartered banks. So right now, the Department of Banking for Connecticut regulates state chartered banks and credit unions. We will also do a lunch and learn webinar with the Department of Banking um, this coming May. In a couple of weeks, we'll be um, announcing the lunch and learn. Our April webinar, Lunch and Learn Canada Business Webinar Series, um, during the month of April, we had five, well, one, in, one in, in March, and then we had a series in May, and um, it was around some of the topics that we've discussed, but we wanted to review them again as we knew that the application periods were closing for some of the um, 
some of the licenses. So the, the cannabis overview, license and fees, business plan overview, marketing best practices, that was actually a new one. Um, accessing capital and funding your business and backers and investors, what you need to know. That was also a new webinar for us. So between February and April, we've had 787 attendees. We've had 2013 views on YouTube. We've answered over 640 questions and we have a mailing list of over 250. Applications submitted as of 428, delivery service under social equity. And these numbers have skyrocketed since our last meeting um, in April. So we have 23 applications for delivery service, 711 micro cultivator, 1,957 retailer, food and beverage, 11, product manufacturer, 19, product packager, nine, transporter, five, and hybrid retailer, 298. And you will see that the numbers for social equity are in many cases surpassing the general lottery, which is um, a good thing. That is my report for this month. I don't if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Councilman that's Jefferson. Me. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Good morning, Madam Executive Director. Uh, and thank you for that report. I see you guys have been very, very busy. Very uh, my question, do we have a list of frequently asked questions? We do. We are putting those questions together right now. Um, Christina and uh, Komla are in the process of putting that together and they should be ready to post um, by the end of this week. And where will they post? They will post on our website, the Social Equity Council website. And, I'm, uh, and we're going to get a presentation from the individuals uh, who will be charged with revamping the website, or is that something, or am I, am I nope. off base? Nope, that's happening today. That's that happening. Happen. Yes, Camelo okay. Communication. They're on the, they're on line with us now. Okay, good. good. Okay. And if I may add, there are... Um, already some frequently asked questions on the DCP web website. Um, I will share that, that link with the council as well. Okay, and Madam Executive Director, can you just share the link? It's hard to navigate the website quite frankly right now. So can you just share the link where I can find those yes. frequently asked? Okay. We, we will send the frequently asked questions to the council members mm -hmm. and we will post them on the website and send you the link of where you can find them. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Okay, if there are no other questions, I would like to ask Andrew Clark um, from the University of Connecticut and his team to provide an update on the cannabis study. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Andrew, if you are ready. Um, yes. You're on. <laughs> Pleasure to see everybody this morning. Uh, I'm Andrew Clark. I direct the Institute for Municipal and Regional Policy here at the University of Connecticut. And uh, I'm leading the IMRP team responsible for producing the uh, third party SCC study. With me today are Dr. Mohammed Al Qadri, who, when we started this project, was um, the chair of the Department of Public Policy at UConn, and now is the director of the School of Public Policy at UConn, uh, and as well as Irvine Peksagaya, who is program administrator within our Children uh, with Incarcerated Parents Project at the IMRP, uh, but is also a member, along with about 10 others here at, the, uh, at UConn, uh, as part of the uh, SEC study team. So I'll actually share my screen now. And give a little uh, update on where we're at. Can everybody see that okay? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So uh, this is a similar format to the uh, update that we provided the SEC on the February 1 meeting. Uh, so essentially, it's to inform members and staff of the progress of the statutory required independent third party cannabis equity study, which we're doing. So timeline, some of this is the same, some of it's updated. 
Uh, as you all know, June 22, 2021 is when the law was signed by Governor Lamont. Uh, the RFP was issued uh, for the study, which was in the law on September 17th, 2021. We were informed of our acceptance on November 5th. Uh, and December 27th, um, we through February 2nd, 2022, so we completed it just after uh, our last presentation, we, uh, as part of the study, did interviews with the SCC members. Um, from January through April of this year, uh, we went through the process of finalizing and getting information from DESP for the data sharing on arrest and conviction data, and we'll be updating that um, later on. And then finally, um, it was a long process, but we were able to bring it past the finish line. On March 31st, we signed the final MOU with SEC uh, and Yukon. And uh, the project dates, just so everybody knows, are December 1, 2021 and September 30th, 2022. Uh, so just a little bit of just a reminder, because it's been a few months on uh, what the actual law said about the study. Uh, so essentially what we are to do uh, is to look at the historical and present day social, economic and familial consequences of cannabis prohibition, and the criminalization and stigmatization of cannabis use and related public policies. The historical and present day structures, patterns, causes, and consequences of intentional and unintentional racial discrimination and racial disparities in the development, application, and enforcement of cannabis prohibition and related public policies. The foreseeable long-term social, economic, and familial consequences of unremedied past racial discrimination and disparities arising from past and continued, as, continued cannabis prohibition, stigmatization, and criminalization. Existing patterns of racial discrimination and racial disparities in access to entrepreneurship, employment, and other economic benefits arising in the lawful palliative use, cannabis sector as established uh, per state statutes, and any other matters the council deems relevant and feasible for the study. And certainly appreciate Chair Comer's uh, introduction. Uh, and we are in 20 years of doing this work, full well aware of the racial and ethnic disparities uh, in the war on drugs, uh, in cannabis in particular, and that uh, Teddy Roosevelt quote is actually um, prominent in our office as well. Um, so the study goals that we have uh, per the um, RFP is to ensure that the nascent cannabis industry is equitably reflecting the population of Connecticut, to ensure that revenues from this new industry are benefiting communities that have been negatively impacted by the criminalization of cannabis, to ensure that the criteria established for social equity applicants are correct in aiding impacted communities, and to provide workforce development opportunities and training to aid people from these communities in gaining employment, access to capital, and support starting in, uh, in starting businesses. And the findings produced from our study will help to inform the SEC's approach to administration outreach verification and support services for applicants. Uh, so here's the design and updates. Uh, some of this you've seen, but the updates uh, obviously are new um, per today's date uh, too. So the methodology, uh, this uh, what we're doing is uh, the first is uh, analyzing arrest and sentencing data re related to cannabis criminalization and we're doing it by municipality and uh, zip code. Uh, the study will provide a trend for each of the municipalities for years available and the data sets of sentencing and policing and an intersection of the arrest and sentencing trends with available socioeconomic indicators and the data is currently being mapped. Um, so I will now turn it over to Dr. al uh, who will give an update on what we're learning from this data and when you can anticipate getting information from us. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for, uh, for letting us uh, give you an update on this. Um, so we are very excited, obviously, here that we got about a million records from DESP and we are uh, thrilled as the researchers can be um, to have that data and to start working with that data. Obviously, the first uh, thing we are doing is cleaning up the data. So we received arrest records from DESP for all drug-related offenses dating back to 1982. 
more like 1983 because there were only a few cases from 1982. I think there was some kind of a, uh, so we eliminated 1982 and we started with 1983, essentially. Uh, we had over 1 million arrest records received, um, 1 million and 50,000 to be exact. Many records were multiple chargers for the same arrest incident. So our first step was to um, reduce them to one record per arrest incident. Um, data has been cleaned and geocoded so far. Uh, records from 1982 were removed, as I said earlier, because very few were in the data set. Records with no address or an address uh, or an out of state address were removed. About 43,000 records were removed because um, they either had no address or an address outside, um, outside Connecticut. Duplicate docket numbers were removed again. Uh, so we go to the next one. The data that remained after cleaning is we have about 500,070 unique drug-related arrests between 1983 and 2020. Um, and we have 214,172 arrests with guilty convictions. Um, researchers, uh, that's us, are currently conducting an analysis of both arrest and conviction records in conjunction with unemployment and poverty data indicators to identify potential DEIAs. So the first one in that, uh, the first bullet there is unemployment rate above 10% and conviction rate above 10%. And that is the current model that's in the legislation. What we also plan to do is give you uh, some if-then scenarios with the other three bullets. Um, what would happen if we use poverty rate above 10% um, and in combination with a conviction rate of above 10%, um, <clears throat> more like or a conviction rate of above 10%, unemployment rate above 10% uh, or an arrest rate above 10%, uh, poverty rate above 10% and or, uh, or arrest rate above 10%. So the idea here is to give you if-then scenarios, uh, what would happen if we use this measure versus this measure and using um, unemployment rate, poverty rate as measures of um, poverty or unemployment in, in census tracts and conviction versus arrest uh, data. So we will, we will explore these. We are aware that College towns tend to uh, ruin the, the poverty rate for, uh, for a lot of uh, census tracts, and we are trying to figure a way to adjust for that. Uh, researchers we're, will also, we will also explore other potential data accommodations that should be considered. Um, and that is, I believe, our data analysis update. We are moving and um, we should have something pretty soon. Um, and I'll just pause there because, uh, as you'll see, we have um, <clears throat> we're going to be completing portions of the uh, study at different times. And you know, we certainly, as as our intention and in, as for the MOU, will deliver um, the results in one document. However. If the SEC wanted to uh, have separate presentations, if it made sense to do that to particular uh, subcommittees as you're working on things, um, please let us know and, and we'd be happy to do that. So uh, I will move on now to the um, best practices exploration, which is uh, another component of the study. And that's where we're looking at other states that have already legalized cannabis uh, and, and have addressed social equity concerns and the extent to which these states have had success or having success in the surveyed programs. And we'll also explore the potential success of importing these practices. And the update, this is still currently in process as you all I'm sure well know that um, uh, as you are working in this state, it's similar in other states and municipalities and the like. So, you know, every day there's something we can update our study with. Uh, it's quite a moving target. And there aren't really per se best practices, but we are finding areas that are worthy of consideration 
in Connecticut. And so we will address definitions of social equity applicants, including disproportionately impacted areas, um, collaborative partner recommendations, uh, for instance, municip municipalities that are doing things uh, that uh, probably municipalities in the state would be interested in hearing about, higher education, what, what's happening there with nonprofits, um, and also community reinvestment components uh, in the process there. Uh, finally, workforce and economic development opportunities. And we anticipate completion of the study. As I mentioned, this probably could go on at any time, but uh, June 30th, 2022. Uh, the next phase uh, or aspect of the study is uh, focus groups and qualitative interviews uh, with the SEC members. As I mentioned earlier, we completed that, as you all will know. Um, and it really has assisted us with defining the scope of the study and understanding perspectives and goals of uh, SEC members. So we thank you for that. Um, as part of that qualitative work, um, we are also going to be interviewing individuals affected by cannabis arrests or sentencing to explore the impact of cannabis criminalization on their lives, uh, either their health, their education outcomes, employment, housing, as well as ways to remediate negative impacts. What are the things that those individuals think could help with remediating it, um, things that have negatively occurred because of being caught uh, within the war on drugs? But what are the things that could be done um, prospectively uh, to address the situation uh, for individuals. Um, participants will be reflective of individuals from DIAs as defined uh, by the law. Um, and this is something to uh, this next one, the focus group specific leaders, we'd like to invite the SEC. Uh, if there are any members uh, that are interested in participating in the focus groups, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, what we're looking to do, as we mentioned in our individual interviews, is get civic leaders from communities that witness the highest negative impact of the cannabis criminalization. And we'll be discussing historical and present day impact of cannabis cr criminalization in their communities. And also uh, the ideas for community and re reinvestment and strategies to improve services and programs in their communities. So we're right at the portion um, where we will be submitting uh, we finalized the design and submitting it to the Yukon IRB, the Institutional Review Board, which makes sure that we don't negatively impact the human subjects that are going to be involved. Uh, and so what we would just need to know is if there are any SEC members who are interested in participating, and then we can talk to you offline and um, incorporate you into the, the final design so that we can submit to the IRB. So we anticipate the begin the focus groups uh, late May and continue through June and the write-ups will be incorporated into the final report. And I know that um, uh, uh, Director uh, Clay had asked uh, me to pause here if there were any questions about what the time commitment would be, what that would look like. I'd be happy to answer those now. Elton Jefferson, you're on mute. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, good morning, Andrew, and uh, to your team. Doing a wonderful job. I'm, I'm very excited about the uh, study. I can't wait to read it. Uh, as, as to the uh, best practice, uh, as far as the DIAs are concerned, um, could you give me a hint as to um, which um, states, in your estimate, um, served as a best practice for establishing the criteria for the DIAs. I was particularly impressed with Illinois, but I, uh, and the reduced um, lunches uh, that were taken, uh, free lunches that were taken into consideration in establishing their DIAs. But uh, can you give me a hint about what you guys found? So I'm not leading the, the team that's doing that portion of it, and I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, I think it would probably be better if um, we came back with all of them with that. But what I'd say is, yes, Illinois is, in, um, is a state that we've been looking at, uh, in particular, is uh, Colorado and, and California as well. But, um, but I, I really wouldn't be in a position to, to answer that question. Um, That's okay. Um, my other question around- I can get back to you on that. So, no, no problem. And um, my other question is, uh, in terms of best practice, um, 
again, with the uh, access to capital, um, <clears throat> can you give us a hint as to the states that are most impressive in terms of helping uh, social equity applicants um, access capital? Uh, well, again, uh, it would be the same answer as the first, but what I'd say is in a lot of ways, uh, what we're finding are the things that aren't working. <laughs> and um, and uh, I think access to capital is obviously a huge issue in, in this industry. Uh, but I think also um, equally important is uh, kind of the foundation that municipalities or, or the state can provide uh, individuals and in navigating um, uh, multiple aspects of how do you uh, stand up a, a business um, on the legal side of it, uh, zoning side of it, uh, and in other areas. Uh, and so, um, again, I, I'd be happy to come back to you with if there's uh, this that that portion of the study team has particular ideas of. Uh, uh, which places are best, um, and I'll take note of that and get back to you. But uh, that's what um, the general findings are. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Councilman Shirley, you're on mute. Uh, at the risk of uh, asking the same question, I, I'm just I'm curious though: is have you seen uh, any states? that either act as intermediaries in the provision of capital or that are directly providing capital through uh, a bonding mechanism or, or some other mechanism? Uh, again, I'd have to have the same yeah. answer. I apologize okay. for that. I would have uh, made sure that the other uh, um, members of the team were here to, to directly answer those. Um, uh, but but what I would say in, in terms of that is that it's it appears as though um, one of the most important components that we're seeing is uh, particular um, municipalities and what they're doing to be innovative in assisting individuals on the ground, not necessarily statewide, but um, the, the municipalities. So, uh, okay. but I will um, take note of that and also get back to you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Councilman Walton and then Councilwoman Shaw. Great, thank you. I, my question was um, the slide that talked about the guilty uh, convictions of, the, of those 240,000 plus guilty convictions, is that of the 500,000 unique that were scrubbed or is that the total number of arrests between 1983 and 2020? So the um, so that is um, the the two hundred and forty th or the two hundred and I think forty thousand are the number of guilty unique guilty uh, or unique convictions that we had between nineteen eighty three and uh, twenty twenty essentially. So okay. they're not that's not the arrests. The arrests are about five hundred thousand. Okay, I, I guess for me it was a little confusing because it said after it scrubbed it had 500,000. And I was just thinking if you had that, because I'm looking at the percentages of guilty verdicts versus the number of arrests. Yeah, so the records we had were about a million. And then, uh, but there were multiple entries per, so each charge has its own docket entry. And what we did is we reduced those to one docket entry per person. And that brought us from a million fifty to about five hundred thousand arrests, and um, and then we did the same for the convictions. We started off with a higher number uh, because people would be, you know, would have under for the same incident would have multiple entries uh, on the same docket and multiple convictions on the same docket, 
And what we did is we reduced that to one conviction per person. So if somebody was convicted, convicted for anything on that docket that's drug related, they got counted in that 240,000 that we ended up with at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. I'm not a legal expert, so I'll probably have to talk to someone. Um, but yeah. thank you for that. Uh, you know, I think it does make sense how you're explaining. I was just trying to see if that's the true accurate number of convictions versus arrests and things of that nature. But I won't prolong. So thank you for that. Yeah, but I mean, this is this is the best data that the state has. Okay, thank you. It's, I mean, and what's missing in that data is actually we don't even desk doesn't include um, uh, ethnicity on the arrest records. So we don't have ethnic, we have race, but we don't have ethnicity on the arrest records. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councilwoman Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and good morning all. Um, thank you for the update on your research. I too am uh, anxiously awaiting uh, your final report. Uh, Mr. Clark, I have a, a question about the scope of your engagement. And um, just curious to know if your work includes a comparison with other states that have a comparable social equity framework. And if so, whether there's any assessment or a comparison of the a uh, broader economic impact uh, of these socially equity applicant-led licenses and businesses. Um, just trying to get a sense of what works about the social equity framework and, and whether there are any steps to, to measure uh, that progress. Yes, so um, if I understand correctly, it's um, for the states that have social equity components, have they, um, put in measures to understand if what they're doing is working. Exactly. <laughs> and if so, um, what can we know about that? And yes, that is a, a portion of the study uh, would be looking at what other states are doing in that, and also recommending to Connecticut how you would be able to, how we would be able to assess um, essentially positive outcomes uh, with regards to your charge. So yes, that would be a portion of it. Great, looking forward to that. Thank you. Any other questions? All righty. Well, UConn Public Policy Team, thank you so much, Irvine, Andrew, Mohammed. Appreciate the information and look forward to further updates. I'll turn it back to Director Clay. Thank you. Thank you. And the final uh, item on my agenda is a letter of support for the Federal Safe Banking Act. And I will, um, that letter is in draft and I will send that out to the council um, by day's end for review. And with that said, my report is concluded. Any other questions for Director Clay before we move on? Councilwoman, should I see your, your hand up? Is that for, okay, all right. Just wanted to make sure, great. Okay, we'll now move on to our committee reports and we will start with Chairwoman Shaw and the Finance Committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Finance Committee um, has not met um, uh, since February, um, but we are in touch with our executive director, our interim executive director, um, to ensure the ongoing oversight of the expenditure of funds for the administrative support for the Social Equity Council. So uh, we are working with Ms. Clay and DECD staff uh, where the SEC is formally housed for administrative purposes. And uh, so the Finance Committee will, we're, we're talking about the format for the reporting of actual expenditures as compared with projected expenditures, because our primary objective is to ensure that uh, whatever resources are necessary in order to carry out uh, some of the technical assistance um, that is part of this council's work, um, as well as other um, items, that are other expenditures in connection with the work, uh, we wanna make sure that if a bonding request needs to go in, that that is done so in a timely basis. So um, there is no short-term need for um, tapping into the uh, bond funds that have been authorized. So, um, so we expect to have uh, further updates um, at the next and subsequent uh, meetings of this council. And that represents my report. 
Thank you, Chairwoman Shaw. Any questions? All righty. Moving right along. Next up is the policy committee. Chairman Shirley, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. As, uh, as Madam Chair indicated at the beginning uh, of the meeting, um, I would like to make a motion that the Social Equity Council reconsider a vote to exclude the existing backers tax return requirements from all future uh, social equity applications. I second the motion. Okay, discussion. To you, Madam Chairwoman, I could be wrong, but I do believe that folks who voted in the negative at the previous meeting have to make the motion and second the motion to reconsider. Yeah. I believe Chairman uh -huh. Shirley voted in the affirmative. If he vote, if he has a motion to reconsider, I don't think under parliamentary procedure that's appropriate. Thank you. May I ask for our attorney um, to weigh <clears throat> in? Since I voted in the negative, I move. If you withdraw your motion, Councilman Shirley, I, I will move. Right. I will move, I, I am right, I will move to reconsider the motion to exclude tax returns. Uh, thank you, Councilman Gaddis, and I, I will with, withdraw. Now we need someone else who voted in I'll the negative. Second. I voted in the negative, I'll second. This is Samira Gordon. All right, we're all set now. Thank you so much, thank you Councilman that. Gaddis <laughs> and Councilwoman Gordon. Um, discussion? Hearing none. I, I, uh, I just want to say that I, I appreciate everyone's due diligence on this matter. Um, you know, I was, I was a banker for a number of years, and I like tax returns. And as a steward of taxpayers' resources, I feel that it's inherent that we have as many safeguards and guardrails as possible. However, after talking to a whole lot of people <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, I do believe we have measures in place to make sure there's no nefarious activities going on, to make sure we account for legitimate income. And uh, I am personally, as a councilman, satisfied with the due diligence that's done behind the scenes. So I will be voting to uh, exempt the tax returns moving forward. And thank everybody for everything that you are doing. Thank you, Councilman Gaddis. You. Councilwoman Shaw. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I too, uh, I'm grateful for the time spent explaining the rationale for the tax return information in the first instance. And, you know, I, I, I think it is um, a reflection of the earnestness on the part of this council that we wanted to be very careful when this vote was first presented, that we didn't want to take any action which would be perceived as um, moving away from the transparency that I think we all uh, advocate for. So um, I am satisfied uh, given the nexus between the tax return information and the qualification for social equity applicants as a necessary criteria for ensuring that the right universe of applicants benefits from um, the preferential treatment that this lottery system uh, contemplates. Um, that tax return information is not necessary uh, and, and is not, does not serve to validate uh, the eligibility of backers in the same way. Um, and so I was satisfied, uh, again, given uh, Chair, Chairwoman Comer's uh, patience in explaining it and making available resources um, to, to explain the, the broader context. Um, and, I, and I would just end with the piece that lies within the jurisdiction of this Social Equity Council, which relates primarily to the social equity applicants, although not exclusively, because this council does have a responsibility to evaluate the workforce uh, training programs that are part of um, uh, applications. I will say that um, 
I'm satisfied that uh, there's been a thoughtful approach to how to ensure that we get the right information without creating an undue burden for those who would participate in this process. So thank you. And um, I intend to vote in the affirmative on this motion. Thank you, Councilwoman Shaw. Councilman Pelka. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, I appreciate, I join uh, fellow council members in expressing appreciation for the support uh, provided to um, explore this matter in greater detail between our previous meeting and the current one. I had just one question. Um, I wonder if anyone on the council or attending could um, elaborate uh, on the um, documents that applicant backers are required to submit, especially those that include you know, financial information. It was helpful for me to learn the you know, full array of documents that are provided and how many of them uh, com combine to provide the review. Uh, I hate to put anyone on the spot, but in, if there is someone here, I thought it would be helpful just to, to put that forward for every, you know, to, to I guess to, to share with the group, if that's possible, Madam Chair. Sure, thank you, Councilman Pelka. Um, Attorney Matrivi, are you on with us? Yes, Great. Madam Chairwoman, thank you very much. Yep. And thank you so much, uh, Council Member Perka. So uh, the document that I require from all the applicants, I'm gonna share my screen just to be able to show. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, this list has all the documents that are currently being uh, required for applicants to submit uh, while going through the social equity program. Now, in addition to this uh, document, uh, there are other documents uh, and a total uh, criminal background check that will be uh, conducted. Uh, to vet all the applicants and the statute in section 29 clearly uh, stress that uh, the department uh, can request any document uh, that in their discretion they need to be able to vet all the applicants including backers. So with that being said, uh, some of the background check uh, will be a state and national criminal check uh, it may include a financial history check, uh, it provide demographic information, and uh, also uh, this uh, background check uh, will explore whether individuals applying as a backer or as applicant in general uh, have been convicted in the past for vendor uh, fraud, uh, insurance fraud, forgery, uh, filing a, a false record, uh, bribery uh, related crimes, uh, tax fraud or telephone fraud, identity theft. So those are the some of the elements that will be uh, reviewed through this uh, vetting process uh, that will be conducted not by the SEC, but instead by the Department of Consumer Protection. Madam Chair, thank you very much. I um, it's very helpful for the attorney to provide that summary. Um, and I'm the newest member, so um, maybe especially important information for me to gain context. And so I, I appreciate uh, my fellow council members' uh, patience. And I do intend to vote in the affirmative when the motion comes forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman Pelka. Additional comments. Okay. Um, hearing none, um, before I ask for a vote, do want to again thank Councilman Gaddis for the parliamentary procedure check. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you all so much. All righty. And next, I believe is our outreach committee. And for that, council co-chair Alvario uh, is not with us. So I turn to co-chair Gordon. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
So I, I'm going to take a little, it's going to, I'm going to briefly go over the process that we went through um, for the selection of the marketing firm. Um, in January, we de developed the scope of work for marketing outreach and communication services. And in February, one of the things I want to say, just to preface this conversation, it was really important to um, those for, to Marilyn and I that we worked with a, a firm that was a minority business. We thought, given the impact of the war on drugs on our communities, it really was important that we use the firm that understood what we were trying to accomplish and also um, was capable of communicating in a culturally responsive way. So that was, I think, the guidance that we had used to figure out. And that's how we initially, we had set out, um, or the, through the assistance of the SEC office, sent out the scope of work to seven firms that were listed as minority businesses on the state contract list. Of the seven, five firms responded and uh, received the scope of work and were invited to, to submit proposals. And that all happened in February. In March, um, the selection committee, which was which comprised of Ginny Ray, uh, Andrea Comer, Marilyn, and myself, we set a timeline for proposal review and recommendation. And then in the month of April, we reviewed those five proposals and interviewed two firms. From those two firms, um, we then made a recommendation uh, recommendation um, of Camillo Communication, who was on the call today. And I'll just give you, I know they're going to give their presentation and talk about themselves, so I will not do, I'm going to give you an overview of their bio, so I won't go into too much detail. But what I will say is the committee was thoroughly impressed with their presentation. I think, you know, they have over 60 years, or nearly 60 years of collective specialized marketing, sir, marketing experience. And what was very clear in that presentation is one, they're passionate about the they're passionate about the issue, and two, their language was definitely representative of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, I do will give their bio, so I will not go into too much detail about that. But we, the committee, voted unanimously to recommend Camillo Communication to this to the council. And at the end of this, we're looking for a vote to. Um, authorized communication to be the communication organization that works with the Social Equity Council. So I know we have a lot on the agenda today, so I will pause there. And I believe I am introducing is Wilson, is I think Wilson and his team to give the commission, give the committee a little bit of a highlight of their presentation that they made to us and talk a little bit about their background and why this really matters to them. So I, without further ado, I will kick it over to Camilo Communication. Thank you, Congresswoman Gordon. Appreciate the, the introduction and, and to all the members of the uh, Outreach and Marketing Committee for your confidence in, in presenting us today to the, to the full council. And, um, you know, really wanted to, to say thank you for this opportunity. We're really excited about the opportunity to present to you. Um, we have a very kind of abbreviated version of our full uh, proposal that uh, I think you you will uh, you'll you'll get a good appreciation really as to what we're recommending as as an approach and really working with you collaboratively, um, you know, to to tackle the, these important communication challenges that we have. So with that, I'm going to quickly share my screen and then we'll introduce quickly some of the other members of our of our team that we have with us today. I assume you should be able to see my screen. Wonderful. So um, again, I'm, I'm Wilson Camello. I'm president and chief marketing officer of Camello Communication. Myself specifically, I'm a first generation um, immigrant, grew up in Willimantic, Connecticut. So I'm very familiar with, you know, growing up in, in a DIA and the challenges that, that come with that. Um, first of my family to graduate from college, um, went into the military, into the Air Force as a public affairs officer, graduated from, from UConn. And so, you know, communication has, has always been, you know, my background, but, you know, as an agency, right, and, and certainly from my own personal passion, we've always been, you know, there for addressing different kinds of disparities. So, you know, currently as an agency, yeah. we work with Hartford Healthcare, um, you know, doing a lot of their outreach into the Black and Hispanic communities, 
We're obviously very, very active over the last couple of years with, with COVID and addressing, you know, disparities um, there and obviously, you know, longstanding, um, you know, uh, equity challenges that the healthcare system has and, and what led to, you know, the disproportionate um, cases of COVID and unfortunate COVID deaths. Um, you know, we worked for a number of years with CHED, the College 529 plan. Um, hello, Con Councilwoman Shaw, nice to see you. Um, you know, and, and working with there with addressing, you know, the real fact that Black and Hispanic uh, kids are graduating with the most college debt, which puts them, you know, many steps behind their, their white counterparts. Um, we work with the, the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services and ensuring that people with disabilities also have uh, opportunities uh, with DPH campaign for uh, tobacco free kids, smoking uh, prevention and cessation programs, you know, and the list goes on. I, I'm not going to go too much into this because um, really we're not, we're not, um, you know, here to talk about us, but really to talk about you and what we can do for you. And so, um, one of our messages is, you know, what's behind us is an entire team of professional, creative, strategic um, experts, you know, who are all committed and passionate about this, this issue. Um, joining me today uh, are a couple members of the team. I'll quickly uh, pass it over to, to Ricky if you want to say hello and, and quickly introduce yourself. Sure, sorry, I was on mute. How are you? I'm Ricky Fairley, and um, I am working on strategy on the team. I am really old. I've known Camilla since before he had gray hair. And so um, we worked together for, for many years over the years. And um, I'm a marketing strategist by trade. Um, I've worked in the agency side for about 15 years. Um, prior to that, I, I ran marketing for Coca-Cola and I'm just a brand strategist. So I'm excited to do this work. Um, it's a great area to be talking about for a lot of health reasons. I'm a breast cancer survivor and um, we, you know, I, I do a lot of work in the health arena and I'm excited to meet you guys and do this work with you. So thank you. And JC. How you doing guys? My name is Juan Carlos Sanchez. Uh, I'm a marketing account executive um, here at Camelo Communications. I've been in Connecticut for over 20 years, creating marketing campaigns for companies like ESPN, Univision, Telemundo, and also companies like Yukon Health, Trinity Health in New England. And today I'm happy to be part of the group to help you guys. Thank you. So again, we're not here just to talk about our, ourselves, but also, you know, how we, how we can help you. And so what we had proposed, um, you know, in our response to, to the opportunity was developing an overarching campaign, right? We want to make sure with so much to, to know, I mean, just today and, and what's going on, some of the updates today, um, you know, we have to be the, 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 the resource to develop or deliver, I'm sorry, accurate, trusted and timely information. Um, we obviously have to target uh, our approaches very specifically to, to the state's DIAs. We have to reach out to our social equity entrepreneurs and make sure that they understand the processes, the access to capital, right? What's going to happen, you know, after, after this initial round and, and ramping up for the next round, you know, what that's going to look like. Um, license opportunities, uh, but also let's not forget that there's a major workforce component behind this as well and, and ensuring that our, our marketing plan encompasses that and and it's very clear in terms of the communication, how that's done, what are the requirements, et cetera, so that people also have an opportunity to work in the industry. Um, addressing the obstacles, right? There, there's a lot of obstacles to this. There's people who don't want this in their backyard. There might be some municipalities. There might be some misinformation going out, out there, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm sure soon with what's going to happen with the communication of the initial batch of, uh, of licensee applicants, what that looks like, who's gonna be against that, was the process fair, some of the discussion that happened this morning, we have to be ready for that, not, not necessarily defensively, but going on the offense, right? Developing messages and strategies in a crisis communication plan um, so that we're out there and, and, and we're facing any kinds of issues head on and not just reacting to them. We, we can't do this without the collaboration of a lot of organizations, um, you know, different partners, different stakeholders, throughout the state, in, in government, out of government. You know, there's, there's a lot of warriors right now that are in the community that are, that are, that are um, you know, on this charge and, and pushing for us that we wanna make sure that, that we collaborate with them and, and not to think that this is really, you know, something that we're gonna accomplish all on our own. So those are kind of the general components of, of what we look at and, and consider for an overarching campaign. Um, and then, you know, a little bit more specifically into this, what, what's important for us is that, you know, we really need to go beyond just awareness. You know, awareness for us is, is a first step. Um, we really have to develop approaches where we're touching all of our key audiences at multiple touch points during decision-making processes and that we're, we're driving, um, you know, the education, the information, but more importantly, we're driving action. Um, and so, you know, we take this, 
approach where you know all 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 kind of um, you know decisions to, to either uh, you know apply for something or or, or, or purchase a product or, or or a service kind of takes the same linear role where you go from awareness to consideration to decision, right? So if we take that linear and we we kind of turn on its side, we create you know, what we call a funnel marketing uh, approach where we're, we're driving in people through awareness, but, but really uh, educating them throughout that process all the way through, you know, the, the conversion side. Um, of course, we have to make sure that our approaches are very culturally relevant um, to make sure that they're, they're not just reaching, but connecting with uh, communities of color and, and also a plan that's nimble enough, right, to, to, to retool as needed um, for for the next the next phase, uh, as I mentioned previously, addressing any kind of potential crisis, and so those those are generally the uh, the components to it. Um, I'll let Ricky talk a little bit about kind of our approach as as it comes to communication, specifically to to multicultural audiences. Sure, I think you know a lot of times uh, an um, agency will kind of just put the black person in the ad or this or translate it into Spanish, and we don't do that at all. We we do what we call trans creation, and it's basically using cultural hum humility to adapt a message that's culturally relevant to the audience. So we take the content and the, the messaging that exists, but we really try to adapt it to the audience in a way that's gonna be palatable to them into their culture, into our culture, and um, so I should say. And, and um, But it really takes a lot more than just translation. It really is you know, using, again, cultural humility to get the message right with the right voice, the right audience in the right place. And we try to, to make our messaging relevant so that it really reaches people where they live, work, play, and pray. Thank you, Ricky. So in terms of breaking it down a little bit more tactically, you know, we do look at the website as, as a core component of this. And I think it was, it was Councilman Jefferson that mentioned about it. It's difficult and a little bit cumbersome to navigate. You know, we, we noticed that as well. And, you know, we look at what some of the other states are doing as well that we can, you know, emulate some of those approaches. But you know, our idea is really to use the, the website as our overarching uh, approach, and then using different kinds of communication strategies to drive traffic to the website, um, where we can we can not only lead them to, to additional information, you know, we can retarget, remarket um, using some technologies that we're able to uh, to apply, etc. And, and as I mentioned, go beyond just awareness. Uh, but drive them to consideration and then driving to action, answering their questions, being able to, you know, capture their, their data, as, as I mentioned as well. Um, and, and so again, the website becomes a really core component to this. Um, paid media, you know, because this is such a targeted campaign in terms of, you know, we know specifically what geographies we want to reach and, you know, what types of characteristics, um, digital marketing becomes a great asset for us. And, and digital marketing allows us to target very, very granularly across, you know, demographics, ages, interests, uh, characteristics, et cetera. And the beauty of it is it's very, very measurable. And what's even better is that we're very efficient with our advertising dollars, right? We're not just flooding the entire state with, with marketing messages where we're actually reaching people very, very specifically um, with those messages. And so, you know, here's just a simple kind of banner ad that we did last year for the Lieutenant Governor when we ran the, uh, the Connecticut 2020 Census campaign, um, you know, as we did that, you know, working with, um, you know, some of the media, um, specifically media that serve the black and brown communities, um, not just running advertising, but how do we engage them in partnerships where they become part of this effort as well? We did this very successfully um, with chat. We did it very successfully recently with, uh, with Hartford Healthcare and COVID where it wasn't just, you know, an entity like Hartford Healthcare saying, you know, get your shop, but it's, you know, it's DJ Buck from Hot 93.7 saying, guys, this is important for us. It's for our community. It's for our grandparents, um, et cetera. And so it, it, it takes this message really to a very credible uh, approach. You know, we use them as, you know, what we call brand ambassadors or, or message surrogates. Um, so, you know, again, we want to develop a, a campaign that's very, very collaborative where we're using many different types of, of folks that are getting out there. Um, and, and sharing our messages, uh, you know, in, in the way we want them to, to, be, to be delivered. Social media, of course, um, you know, everybody lives on their phones these days. Um, you know, there's so much to talk about. So one of the strategies that we take with our clients is, is, is taking all the type of communication that we have to make and, and dividing it into like three or four messaging pillars. 
so that we make sure that whatever we post, whatever content goes out there aligns with a strategic messaging pillar. Um, otherwise, we're just kind of coming up with things, you know, ad hoc. Um, you know, we, we develop, you know, social posts, campaigns, um, you know, dynamic videos, graphics, et cetera, um, and be able to, to target these again, very, very specific measure, drive traffic, et cetera. So again, social media becomes, you know, a, a very powerful tool for us to deliver our, our messages. Um, I'll, I'll have JC talk a little bit about, you know, the ways we can use video to, to create, you know, additional, you know, uh, interest and in, in creating a kind of a movement behind this. Um, thank you, Wilson, everyone. We believe that video is a powerful tool that we have in social media and broadcasting. And in this situation, I think it, it's something that we can use for our benefit. Um, like Wilson discussed a couple of minutes ago, having people, key people from the community, having their feedback, expressing themselves about the topic, given their belief, their thoughts about opinions, it's something that helps the community. Finding someone that you know that might be probably someone public from a TV station, radio station, or someone that works in the community really close with Latinos and, and the Black community can help uh, generate more information with this uh, type of videos. So we believe that um, bringing and putting together some videos for social media where people can find, like I said, community leaders, people that will get um, information from will be really helpful. And these videos will live in social medias. Uh, people nowadays, um, they're always on their tablets and phones. And while you're scrolling, you're not only reading the information, but you're looking at someone that you might know from the community giving you the information that you need and probably explaining you why it's important. So we believe that videos is a good target nowadays. Um, people watch, and as soon as you watch a video, it becomes viral. And more people from your feed, that can be Instagram, that can be Facebook, um, get information from that video, even though they might not be following the website or might not be following that specific person. So one of the goals is to recommend developing serious short videos, uh, using people from the community, organizers, uh, people that talk about these issues. Yeah, we use it successful again, just using the, the census campaign. It wasn't just us saying, go get counted, right? It was Lieutenant Santiago saying, you know, the money helps fund our fire department, right? I'm counting on you to get counted. That, that was the message that we took to the people. So um, again, these, these approaches can be very, very powerful. We'd love to work with you in collaboration to, to identify who we feel are our strong message surrogates for this. Um, public relations and earned media, of course, um, you know, it's something that, um, you know, we kind of see as an ongoing effort, you know, whether these are press releases or announcing events that are taking place, et cetera, op-eds, editorials, um, you know, strategically placed maybe in certain municipalities, um, you know, to target the, the right types of, of, of folks. So, you know, we'd be very, very specific and very uh, strategic with our public relations and, and earned media. And of course, you know, this would include, you know, outreach into, um, you know, outlets that serve multicultural communities, multi-language -langu as well. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work, um, you know, in not, not only English and Spanish, but the Portuguese uh, and Polish uh, as well. So, um, you know, we wanna make sure that uh, we're reaching as, as many folks as, as possible and not, letting you know, language be a barrier for, for us to, to reach them. And you know, lastly, events um, are gonna be important. You're, you're doing them already. So we wanna make sure that, um, you know, that we're tied into that, we're helping to promote them. There might be additional events that we can put on. You know, we, we, you know, we talked about potentially even something like a, a symposium where there's a, an information or vendor showcase, for example, or maybe it's a workforce development type of event. So, you know, we feel like like putting putting on events, whether they're virtual or in person, you know, can be again a very very powerful tool to make sure that you know we meet directly with the people. We can do these in the specific communities and in specific DIAs as well to make sure that um, you know, much like you you know you wanted to work with a uh, a marketing agency that that's multicultural or, or minority owned. You know, let's also support these particular communities, right? Use their vendors, use their venues, and things like that, so that. We're also being equitable with with how we're you know uh, even conducting our outreach. So um, so that's again a very thirty thousand foot um, you know view of, of of what we're recommending um, for for us in terms of, of working together. Um, how how would we begin? Very simply, um, you know we'd love to work um, you know with you in terms of um, a startup session. So this would be uh, conducting a, an internal strategy and immersion session. Right, we want to learn more about. Um, you know, the, the, the council, its missions, you know, what's been done in the past, what's, what's missed, what we think can work. Again, we want to create a very collaborative in, environment for this, um, review the details, align our approaches, and specifically develop um, measurement, 
right? How are we going to measure success? Uh, you know, a year from now, when we look back and say, were we successful? You know, obviously there's 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 metrics like you know the number of, of licensees, of course, but but what other metrics you know do you feel are important to measure um, in terms of of ensuring success? And so we wanted to find those and then create mechanisms to uh, to measure them. Research review is, is great to hear this this uh, study going on from my alma mater at UConn, um, but other things that are out there that we can use. Um, other states, as, as some people mentioned, Illinois. I think all of us recognize as as a as a, as a great case example. And so what can we learn? So there's things that we don't have to recreate the wheel. And then what are mistakes that are made so we don't have to make those same mistakes, right? And be as effective as we can. Um, a plan, of course, um, you know, creating a, a plan that includes objectives, goals, strategies, uh, tactics, et cetera, to not just uh, generate awareness, as I mentioned, but, you know, uh, motivate people to, uh, to action. Um, and lastly, you know, the, the, what it's going to look like, right? We want to make sure that we have a a cohesive look and feel and messaging to our campaign. Um, you know, so uh, this, of course, would would include what Ricky had talked about uh, in terms of ensuring you know cultural relevance and cultural humility um, with our messaging and our messaging structure, and uh, you know that we're reaching people with credibility and and building trust um, in in our message. And so um, that's it. I mean, we you know we love an opportunity to work with you. We appreciate the opportunity to present to you, and uh, you know we're we're ready to go when you are. So. I think with that, I'll stop sharing and, and uh, perhaps open up uh, to any potential questions if, if that's okay. Thank you so much, Wilson and team. Um, questions, comments, thoughts from my esteemed council members. Uh, to you, Madam Chairwoman, I just wanna say I like the energy and I like the colors because it's kind of gloomy outside and that orange pops. Yes, <laughs> yes it's, 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 it's strong without being overpowering like a red. That's why we picked it. <laughs> Thank you. Any additional comments? I have a question. Uh, I too like the colors. They're the same colors of the firm where I work. Uh, we use the same colors. Very great. Um, question is, so, What's the overall message that we're trying? Is is there a central theme that we're trying to drive home? Uh, we ha we have applicants. Um, we are not necessarily trying to drive demand for the product. I don't think. But so, what's the overall um, message that we're trying to get across? I, I think there, I think there's a few messages. I think there's there's you know room for for kind of segmented or, or multiple messages. I think obviously. You know, an obvious one is, is ensuring that people are aware of, you know, the equity component to this. So, so whether that's driving, you know, direct license applications or not, I think it's good for people who aren't social equity you know, entrepreneurs to, to know about this, right? P people want to feel good about their government, what the government's doing, um, you know, and all the studies show that, you know, pe people are reacting very positively um, to message of, of inclusivity and, and equity. So I think that's, that's one, um, you know, one particular message. Um, I think the workforce component is is there. So, you know, I think one of the messages is that, you know, you don't have to just be a licensee. There's other, there's other opportunities, you know, to this as well. So um, I, I don't think we have to hang ourselves up only on the licensing part. It's obviously a major component, but I think there's there's room for some, some other uh, kind of messaging structures. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's a message of aspiration. I think people... Right. I mean, somebody mentioned that there's a lot of money to be made here. And so maybe there's somebody who had something in their past that to say, listen, this is going to hang you up. There's opportunities in this particular industry, particularly one that was inequitable, right, to, to you as, you know, as, as you were coming up. And so um, I would say just off the top of my head, I think those are a couple. I don't know if Ricky, you know, if you have any anything else to add to that. Oops, I think you captured it all. It's really kind of reflecting you know, kind of getting into the heads of what we want people to motivate them to do to change their behavior. So, any and all of that, so. Thank you, yeah. Sure. Councilwoman Valerie. I'm really excited about the marketing campaign. I just wanted to let you be aware um, that our committee, the Workforce Development Committee, um, is going to be working on the career pathways and the different job opportunities that are available within the cannabis industry. 
We also want to make sure that people understand that um, if they are have been impacted on the war on drugs and they're still looking to get into a career ladder, and they may not necessarily want to go into the ca cannabis industry, that there are other opportunities as well. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to, um, to work with you a bit and uh, contribute to some of the messaging around the workforce development component with our subcommittee. Right. So thank you for your work. So thank you for that. As I mentioned, we really want this need, needed to be collaborative. So I appreciate that. Anyone else? All righty, I will turn it back over to Co-Chair Gordon. I believe there is an action item. Yeah, so I believe I'm gonna, if I mess this up, someone correct me. I um, need a motion to approve Camillo Communication as the communication uh, vendor for the Social Equity Council. So move. Second. Perfect. Um, Right. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Fantastic. Um, Wilson, Ricky, JC, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're, We're very, very grateful. We're very, very grateful and excited to work with you guys. Excited to thank work you. with you as well. Thank you. So much. Have a blessed day. You too, thanks. Take care, bye-bye. All righty. Um, next up, we have our workforce committee and that is Chairwoman Bowers. Hello everyone. The workforce committee met this month and we spent some time looking over the criteria for determining if the workforce plans for um, the equity applicants is acceptable or not. And we have a few um, applications, I believe, that need a review for their workforce plans as laid out. And I would like to share my screen if I can. Um, okay, can you all see the equity plan criteria? Okay, so we went back through, we had approved these questions and um, workforce development criteria in a prior meeting last fall. Uh, but what we did here is we updated the first uh, criteria, so we'll need a motion to approve the change. And then we also added points to each of the criteria. So this is a two-part document. This added um, criteria points to each of the questions, and then I'll be sharing with you a rubric that shows exactly the categories and how we're going to delineate um, or provide um, points to each one of these criteria. So this is a document that we've seen before, but one of the things that we updated on this is we had originally talked about requiring workforce development programs for being um, from Connecticut-based training organizations. And since Connecticut is new to this, and we do have many educational institutions that are working on cannabis workforce development programming, we thought it would be important to add that nationally recognized programs would also be acceptable programs for applicants to utilize to train their workforce. So part one is to just add that not only will we, we require the utilization of Connecticut-based workforce training programs, but we'll be adding nationally recognized workforce training programs to support the startup of new businesses by establishing a robust cannabis workforce development pipeline. The rest of these have remained unchanged, but I'll take a moment to uh, review them because they're a, um, referred to in the other document. So the second criteria would be to stipulate the anticipated demographics of the workforce that they're going to target to um, attract people, recruit people into the cannabis industry. Um, we had um, made it very clear that we will focus on individuals who reside in disproportionately impacted areas and or directly historically adversely impacted by the war on drugs and or 
are racial minorities or other unrepresented, underrepresented populations, such as those who have been incarcerated, um, re-entry individuals, low income, people with disabilities, BIPOC plus, et cetera. The next criteria is that businesses must ensure workforce training programs offer a robust suite of core services to every training participant. And these include recruitment, uh, basic skills or remedial skills training, technical and professional skills training, supportive services such as childcare, transportation, and access to technology while they're going through training programs, and job placement in case management and career assessments. And then that applicants must show proof that they plan to continuously invest in hiring new or workers or upskilling additional workers with skills to advance their careers in the cannabis industry. Applicants will further be expected to submit annual reports to measure performance against their original goals. Um, and then we expect businesses to define clear career pathways within the organization and work with employees to develop career progression plans upon being hired, including providing any required services for workers to be able to uh, progress along the said plan. And then lastly, that the Social Equity Council requires a clear understanding of what federal, state, and private investments will be utilized to subsidize tuition and or industry-recognized credential costs for prospective or current employees participating in cannabis or other workforce training programs. And I just noticed that we need to probably take out this word federal because federal funds are not allowed an allowable use um, for cannabis. So there's two things that we need to modify to this document, removing the word federal and adding uh, nationally recognized training programs. Should we do this individually of the approving of the criteria and scoring? Um, I believe what we can do is if you have the all of the amendments or changes in one place, we can certainly um, take that as a vote and then take the, the document as amended. Um, unless they're I'm looking to some of my attorney friends for a procedural um, guidance, if that's not okay. Madam Chairwoman, I think you're right. Uh, we'll have to incorporate the changes and then uh, take the vote as you pointed out. Thank you so much, Attorney Matrivi. Thank you. So this is the criteria for the rubric. So basically we've taken um, the criteria as determined previously in the work plan. And then we've broken it into four different scoring criteria, whether they did not demonstrate anything towards um, forwarding or advancing to the criteria. They were below expectations, they met expectations or they exceeded expectations. And so this is uh, the, the, the points that we have assigned to each of these. The other thing that we need to take into consideration is the weight of each of these in the criteria. So here we looked at you know, where they're getting their source of the training programs is only having 10 points. But then when we look at um, the anticipated demographics and how we're gonna target them uh, for careers in cannabis, that came to 25 points because we felt that that was a much more important aspect of the plan is on the equity piece. Um, also on the, um, the recruitment of the workforce and how they're gonna partner to deliver the services also was very important. So we want to make sure that the core partners to deliver the, the um, core services, such as um, such as re the recruitment, the basic skills, supportive services, have the ability to do that. So for example, our work five regional workforce boards, um, that is um, something that they do on a regular basis. So 
would they or an organization that similar to them be able to actually provide all of those services be named as a partner? So we felt that that was very important and required 25 points. Um, we require 15 points uh, as a total for their career ladder and maintaining um, the continuous investment and upskilling. Also 15 points to define the pathways. And another 10 points um, for funding the um, the sources of the different um, sources for funding to continuously upskill people. So our committee met and we approved of this rubric, scoring rubric. But the other question that we did not answer is what would be the top score required in order to pass? And I'll give you a little bit of um, pertinent real world example of how this works. So currently we're, I'm in the process with my team on scoring grant applications. And we set the bar very high, um, making sure that people needed to score at least 85% of the total to advance forward. And we found that our criteria was very tightly defined. And so we only had two people, two applicants out of 57 that actually met the threshold. So um, we now need to go back to a second round and ask people for clarifications or addi additional information um, in order to ensure that, that they're, they've answered the questions and are meeting the expectations. So I would say here that um, you know, how we word the scoring on this is really important because they, we, we also left it open so that we could go back and ask clarifying questions that could potentially increase people's scores. So I would say that we need to leave some um, flexibility here in determining what the highest scores should be. So I'm opening that up for discussion. Questions from council members. Okay. I don't see any hands. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> Councilman Walton. So thank you for that report. So being this is my second meeting, um, forgive my uh, ignorance, but what type of um, jobs are we talking about? Right. I can share with you, um, we had uh, previously um, sent out a document of the different career ladders within the cannabis industry. So such as in the cultivation, there's different levels of jobs, um, whether you are, um, you know, tending the plants or you're harvesting the plants. There's jobs in retail, whether you are a bud tender or a manager. Or, or an owner. Uh, in logistics, there's another. Um, so there was um, three, or, there was four, I'm forgetting the, the fourth one off the top of my head at the moment, um, that we delineated and determined what the career pathways are in each of those. And we, we need to make that accessible to um, the applicants as they're putting together their plans so that they have an understanding. We looked nationally at what training programs are out there on a national basis. Great, thank you. You're welcome. No questions. Okay, seeing no hands. So may I propose then a 75% threshold instead of 85% as a passing uh, grade and then anything that falls under 75% could go back for clarifying questions. Can I just make a suggestion here? Sorry, this is Sabira Please. Gordon. Are you, do you need to have a minimum score or can you just rank it? Because I've done, I'm just thinking of, I've reviewed grants on grants committees for a number of different organizations and there wasn't necessarily a minimum score. It was like, you just rank it based on some people scored 90, 85 
and then you pick the top three because sometimes just based on how something is worded the applic the applicant yes. the way the answer comes in is not exactly what you're looking for so it just automatically scores lower than what you were what, what was expected so if possible, I just recommend not to have a minimum score and you just rank them based on the numbers. And then if people are scoring lower, you can go back and re-clarify the question. So that was going to be my suggestion, if possible. Thank you, Councilman Gordon. Um, yes, I, I think that's a, a great suggestion. I would say the only um, issue we may run into in doing that is that we won't be reviewing all of the applications at one time. So I believe they will be coming in over a period of time. So I'm not sure how we would be able to um, compare the top scores if we're if they're kind of trickling in versus they come in in one one allotment. Okay. Any additional questions, comments? Okay, seeing none. So I'll make the motion. Um, we're putting the motion to approve the social equity workforce development plan criteria that's, that has document has previously been approved, but we would like to make two amendments. One, to add nationally recognized workforce training programs to the first criteria and to remove federal funding um, for the last criteria. Also to approve the scoring rubric with a minimum score of 75% required to move forward and anything below a 75% with clarifying questions to be asked and rescored. Second. Is there is there a motion? That was the motion. Yes, so that's your motion. Okay, and Councilman Gad is seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, Aye. Opposed? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Thank Chairwoman you, everyone. Valerie, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Naeem, who chairs our Accelerator and Governance Committees, is not with us today. So I'm going to ask Director Clay um, to talk about the Accelerator RF RFP. She did actually mention in her report that um, this Accelerator RFP is currently waiting with um, the Office of Policy and Management. Um, so I will pause and see if there were any additional questions around the accelerator or Director Clay, if you have um, additional context you want to provide. Uh, no, I just know that Council Member uh, Pelka is helping us to get the um, RFP through the OPM process. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Um, the other piece which falls under the Governance Committee is the um, the ethics statement. So I will turn it over to Attorney Matrivi um, for an overview. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to report that SEC uh, now has a, a, the ethics statement, uh, which is a compliance matter with the state uh, code of ethics. Uh, this statement uh, has been added to the agenda and provided to all the members of the council for review and comment. Uh, basically what it covers, and uh, I will just share my screen so you can see. B basically it covers, can you see my screen? Okay, yeah. so uh, basically the ethics statement uh, covers uh, the ethic guidelines that the members of the council so and employees of the council uh, will be following while doing their duties. And it also includes uh, some of the ethics rules that the Public Act 21-1 has created in Section 51, 
which basically prohibit uh, members of the council and employees of the council, as well as former members of the council from contracting uh, on basically matters or contracts that are being handled by SEC. It also uh, addresses uh, the prohibition of the members of the council and former members of the council uh, to apply for a social equity uh, license uh, for at least two years. So th this is important because it will provide the public uh, information as to the rules that the members of the council and the employees of the council will be living by. And as soon as we get the comments from all the members of the council, we will publish it on our website. We will send a copy to uh, DAS and also the State Office of Ethics. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Attorney Matrivi. Questions or comments? Councilwoman Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Council Matrivi, um, are members of the Social Equity Council required to submit annual statements of financial interest uh, to the Office of State Ethics? Thank you, Madam Council Member. It is my understanding that the members of the Social Equity Council are in fact required to submit uh, a statement of ethics because they are public officials and they are making important decisions on state contract uh, and financial uh, items. So yes, the members of the council and the executive members or employees of the council are required to submit annual statement of financial interest. And a follow-up question, um, is the council in compliance given that the deadline was May 1st? Uh, we will have to ask the newest members of the council to uh, comply uh, with that uh, element. Uh, right now, we still need to go back with uh, the newest members of the council. As you know, some members have resigned and new members just started. And uh, this is the second meeting for some of them. So they will be complying with that element as well. Thank you. Sure. Additional questions, comments? Okay. Uh, quick question, when do we need to review the ethics? I, so I know it was set, but I hadn't taken a look at it. Um, when do we need to review? Are we voting on that today or do we just need to review it and provide feedback uh, you, and thoughts and comments? Uh, you just need to review it and provide us with okay. your feedback. It uh, doesn't really require a vote uh, because okay. the state law actually put the responsibility of this specifically on the executive head of the agency. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Attorney Matrivi. Um, at this point, we are going to go into executive session to discuss our personnel matter. Um, you should have received a link from Paige, a Teams link to join that um, for that discussion. And then we will return back to this new meeting to, um, for public comment and conclusion of our meeting. Alrighty, so I will see you all shortly. Thank you. Yeah, I can do
Council Member Walton, I don't if you can, you're on mute. If you can hear us, um, you should have received a link to go into a Teams meeting for executive session.
Councilwoman Shaw is on. Actually, she's, I think she's in now. Thank you. Can we move um, Councilwoman Gordon? She's in attendee room. Great, thank you. All right, I think everyone is here. Yes. Okay. Um, so it. I am calling the Social Equity Council meeting back to order um, as we have concluded our executive session and we'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I have a motion uh, and the motion is for Ginny Ray Clay to become the executive director of the Social Equity Council. So move. Actually, we Corby. need a second. <laughs> second, Corey. Thank you, Councilman Layman and Betts. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Thank you, um, Executive Director Clay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, members of the council. Appreciate it. Appreciate staying on with you. Thank you. We're happy to have you for the ride. Um, okay, um, with that, we are going to move to our public comment portion. Um, I have the list of speakers. The uh, sign up session was from, I believe, 920 to 950. So if you signed up after, or, or if you signed up anytime out of the, outside of that window, your name will not be called. In addition to which, if you did not provide full information, your name will not be called. You will have three minutes to speak. And we begin with Devin Schlake. I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. Mr. Schlake. If you're able to raise your hand, it would help me find you in the list of attendees. There you are. Mr. Schleich, you have the floor. Hello, my name is Devin Schleich of 402 East River Road, Riverton, Connecticut. Um, I'm here today to question the morality and legality behind what you're doing um, by not requiring social equity backers to disclose their tax information. Honestly, I find that this leads to a lot of things that were really not fans of, which would be organized crime, money laundering, um, you know, sex trafficking, real problems that have like tormented our community for a very long time. I myself have gone to prison for nonviolent marijuana crimes. What I'm watching is you keeping me out of this legal system that I have worked so hard as an advocate to be part of. This is unfair to people like me, and there are hundreds like me. We are nonviolent marijuana offenders. We are the basis for what has happened here. The reason we are legal now is because of advocates like me and others. 
and and I just find it atrocious that you're keeping us out of this and it it's just wrong and I really would like you know someone somewhere I've, I've sent out many letters um trying to explain my story and how this has really impacted my life guys this is not a joke this is not a small thing I've been to prison for cannabis and I should never have gone to prison. I'm a good person. My morals are sound and my beliefs are right. And with that, I, uh, I thank you for taking the time to even listen to me because a lot of people have shut me down as they have in the past. Um, you know, I, I really wish someone somewhere would reach out to me personally through email and help me get a license. Help me bring the positivity that I have for the cannabis plant to the patients and people. Because those are the ones, guys, that are really being affected by your decisions. Realize that. We are a community. We are thousands of people here in Connecticut. And you need to listen to us. And, you know... Obviously, I'm a little bit emotional because this is a personal subject. When my freedom is on the line, I take that very personally, as I imagine all of you would. So, you know, thank you for listening to me today. And I hope, you know, in some way, shape or form, someone reaches out to me with, you know, a basis that we can at least discuss, you know, a true micro cultivators license for people like me, a thousand square foot. Look at Vermont's structure. Look, they are trying to incorporate as much of the black market cannabis scene into the legal cannabis scene. They are trying to incorporate individuals like me so I can build a future for my family. Mr. So Schleich, I can have your, a house like you guys. Mr. Schleich, your, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day. You too. God bless. Next is Duncan Markovich. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, thank you. Good, after, good afternoon, members of the Social Equity Council. As we move forward in Connecticut's recreational cannabis use framework, there are several topics that must be continuously addressed in order to encapsulate a true equitable conversation in this dynamic rollout. Lotteries, license caps, and a pay-to-play structure is not equitable. Licenses to operate should be prioritized and protected for Connecticut residents and businesses first and foremost. A meritocracy basis should also be included when considering licensees. The release of all nonviolent cannabis arrests and the erasure of those criminal records must be taken in consideration. A call for better quality cannabis. You cannot, con you cannot call yourselves a social equity council if you do not call out the mold issues in this state. You are now involved in this industry and it is a massive public safety concern. To say it doesn't involve you and it's not under your purview is irresponsible and not the character of someone in a decision-making power. You will put lives at risk. The denial of regulatory capture by the state and legislature and legislators involving multi-state operators and out-of-state interests is getting out of control. The urgent need for a patient-run advocacy council is now very clear and evident. I now cast my vote for my colleague Lou Rinaldi for the position of state patient ombudsman. The inclusion and support of the legacy market and greatly needed caregiver program is also tantamount. There needs to be specialty permitting for cannabis-centric events, event coordinators, and event vendors. This is the lifeblood of the community and where equity is truly seen and served firsthand. There needs to be fair and equitable representation of Connecticut's hemp farmers and the CBD community. And lastly, and most importantly, there needs to be clear transparency in legislation craft between lawmakers, advocates, council members, and the community abroad. Thank you for this opportunity to speak I will leave you with a quote from my mother. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Markovich. Next is David Thompson.
Mr. Tunston still with us? Mr. Thompson, I don't see your name in the list of attendees. If you want to raise your hand, I'll allow you to speak. Maybe move on. Okay. Um, Joseph Raymond Asatulo. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Eileen Kopeck. My apologies. Is Eileen Kopeck still here? Yes. Ms. Kopeck, floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Eileen Kopeck. I live at 201 Elm Street in Groton, Connecticut. Um, thank, thank you for your hard work in, in all this. And Congratulations to Executive Director Clay. Um, I, I'm just here to comment as the um, recreational cannabis starts up, I'm still very concerned about the environmental impact of uh, cannabis production. The um, production facilities are gonna be using a lot more electricity. And for the most part, they don't seem to be into maybe solar power or anything to help offset that. So I'm very concerned about that. I'm also very worried about um, the plastic packaging issues and the plastic pollution involved in disposable vape products. I know some of that has to do with vapes not associated with cannabis, but as, as this, um, ramps up more, there's going to be a lot of that. And there doesn't seem to be any, really any meaningful recycling going on or um, any kind of better way to dispose of these products. And I believe that that falls under um, the producers and quite frankly, also the consumers. We make a choice of what we choose to buy and use and dispose of it. So that that's really all I have to comment on. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you, Ms. Kopeck, appreciate it. Um, next is Joseph Raymond Asatulo. Mr. Asatulo, the floor is yep, yours. Yep, right here. Esteemed members of the Social Equity Council, currently gifting events provide a forum in which patients, veterans, senior citizens, and craft enthusiasts are able to exchange ideas, share resources, and support one another in, arena, in an arena where cannabis use has been destigmatized. For many of them, this is a life-saving medicine, and a good number of the vendors often associated with gifting events rely on their community for support. Donations might be exchanged to put food on the table for a young family or to buy a child's soccer cleats, pay their utility company, put gas in their car, or pay for a school uniform. The gifting events in question are equivalent to a local trading post. They provide a place for people to gather, swap stories, materials, helpful information, gardening tips, and recipes. There is nothing more established in American culture and tradition than a local trading post. And this is a space in which advocates have worked very hard for years to cultivate an atmosphere of acceptance. Targeting this group and imposing fines upon them despite their vulnerability is in, is in itself criminal. The only way to navigate this uncertain terrain is to work together to make gifting safe for all Connecticut residents which includes regulating gifting events in a way that is beneficial to all. Event coordinators should be able to collect donations to compensate the emergency services security personnel that is required to safely operate. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Asatilla. Um, next is Lou Rinaldi. All right, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, good afternoon. It's been a long one today. 
And thanks to all the council members who uh, actually stuck around for this. Uh, the co public comment should be front loaded at these meetings. I find comical Ms. Comer's fanciful notion that she is somehow in the arena when she's simply walking a line. That was a wonderful script that you read, but it means nothing in the end. We see you, we see your actions and that they don't align with the original stated goal of the council. Dan Har did a great job reporting on this for CT Insider last night. It was a great read. You should check it out. Also, Michigan requires tax returns. So I'm curious which specific markets Ms. Comer is referencing when she says that tax returns aren't a standard requirement. Market restriction is what gets every single state in trouble. Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, anyone? And I'm curious how much Ms. Comer contributed to DCP's form letter email about me, a patient advocate which they are sending to state legislators. It was actually leaked to me by Representative Tony Scott. I'm hoping Ms. Comer can speak to how many dossiers DCP keeps on different advocates, why they email legislators behind our backs instead of engaging in good faith. Talking about, there was all these attempts to set up a meeting with me. You asked me to go to one meeting, which I couldn't make because my child was exposed to COVID. And now you're gonna say that I, there was scheduling conflicts? Give me a break. And now, again, congratulations to Director Clay. Where are the policy committee meeting minutes from April 21st? Page says that only you have access to them, so where are they? And social equity applicants surpassing general lottery entries isn't a good thing. It just means that more social equity applicants are gonna get bought out of their ownership stakes. And thus people of color will be kept in the worker class, not the ownership class. Mission accomplished for the corporations, for the four licensed producers. And I'll close with this. Why is CT Innovations, Connecticut Innovations, giving seven figures of Connecticut money to an out of state company? 1906 is the name of the company. Connecticut Innovations giving over a million dollars. Annie Lamont, our governor's wife works closely with Connecticut Innovations. Why are they giving an out-of-state company seven figures to flood the lottery with applications and box Connecticut residents who have been directly impacted, who have been to jail like Devin, boxing them out of this market? Completely inexcusable. This is Connecticut money. It should be staying in Connecticut. It should be going to help Connecticut applicants, people who are supposed to be supported by this effort, not blocked by it. And this council's utter refusal to engage in good faith. I'm sorry I sound super frustrated right now, but none of y'all have ever answered a single one of my questions. Email us, email us, and the emails never get responded to. So Ms. Comer, I ask you directly to please answer any of the questions that I've put forth here. I challenge you to answer a single one of them. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. Your time is up, but you have my email, as you well know. So if you'd like to email me, I'm happy to answer your questions. Next, we have Angelo Graziano. Hello. Yes, hi. How are you doing? Good, Good. how are Council. you? My name is Angelo Graziano from 549 Lake Winnemog Road. I wanted to jump on this call to understand what is going on with multiple tickets from out-of-state entities, most likely MSOs. Have any of you gone on the backer list? Have any of you guys seen the 90% of the tickets being submitted from out-of-state entities? You could easily go on and look. You could see that they're all being submitted from New Jersey, California, Alabama, all of which part are, um, they're not social equity applicants, obviously. Um, I see that you guys took away the tax uh, taxes for the backers, which is a huge uh, no-no, I feel. How will you be able to identify the eligibility of these outside backers that are dumping money into social equity applicants, applications, I mean, um, since you're not looking at the taxes Background check uh, mentioned by the attorney um, does not show everything. Um, even though he said it does show financials, I do not believe it shows everything. Just think about this. A few months ago on one of these calls, there were social equity applicants that were saying 250 is, is too much 
150 is too much for a ticket. Now we're seeing that they're spending 40, 50, $100,000 in tickets on the social equity side, outgrowing the general lottery side. How is that even social equitable? This is not, this is not what this, this program was meant to be. This is meant for social equity candidates that live in Connecticut, not people outside of Connecticut. And um, I hope you guys are able to identify those, um, but without taxes and without other information, I seem, it seems like it's going to be very, very hard to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graziano. Next is Freedom Gerardo. Good afternoon. Uh, how you guys doing? My name is Freedom Gerardo. I live in Danbury, Connecticut. I'm a medical patient, farmer, hemp farmer, um, and an advocate here in the state. Uh, I mean, a lot of people just said what I wanted to say, but the only thing I see in this group of people is that the equity Council was supposed to be the voice of us, people like me, people of color, and you guys are working with the MSOs. Sorry to tell you that. You sound like you are putting MSOs above us. We are gonna become workers because that's how you are putting it with the labor peace agreements. We are gonna become workers, not owners. 56 licenses, I know it's not on you because you're not the people that passed the legislation, but you're supposed to be the voice, but you're not being the voice. You are being embedded. You are being very quiet about what's going on. Hemp farmers should be the first ones to grow this plant without no, no barriers. Four years out of the last six, that's what some hemp farmers are putting forth. It's Mr. Ridiculous. Gerardo, your time is up. So. Yeah, do a better job. Thank you. Um, Jeff Kivlin. I do not see Mr. Kivlin in the list of attendees. Thank you. Gage McCabe. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Gage. I'm a constituent of Manchester and I'm speaking as a voice for the activist community. Um, just had a couple points I wanted to make here. First of all, I was really saddened to hear that the equity council members weren't showing up to the council meetings especially during the critical stages of this bill. Um, we've been out at the Capitol protesting and um, advocating to get our voices heard. It would be um, really helpful if everybody that was appointed to this committee was doing the most that they could to make sure our voices are being heard. Um, and I do recommend replacing any inactive members on this committee with those from the activism community. I'm also very concerned about the language involving jail time that got introduced to this bill. After all the trauma um, from the war on drugs, it shouldn't have even been mentioned. And the fact that it got into writing was really disturbing. I hope that the Equity Council will continue to stand against any future men uh, mentions of this recriminalization. Um, this is something that should not be happening. Also, I implore the council to advocate for us to lower the fees for gifting. Uh, right now, the fees are at $1,000, and this disproportionately affects poor and marginalized communities. Some people are able to afford these fines, no problem. Others, it would send them a whole month without eating. So we need to consider that. In addition um, to what has been mentioned, a lottery for licenses is not equitable. We should remove the cap entirely. Um, and approve all qualified equity applicants. I saw a lot of people on that list, some, some pretty big numbers there. And I think we should approve everyone. Why would we limit the potential of a free market? Um, 
that's cost, pre cost prohibitive and inequitable. The legacy community has a quality reputation and deserves reparations for the war on, on drugs. In addition, um, for a solution that we should provide micro licenses for all small business owners. Uh, this would allow a legal path for all. Instead of um, fining people, we can just pay a reasonable fee for a license and then allow the free market to sort themselves out, just like new, normal capitalism works. Um, cannabis is much more based on reputation than alcohol. People find who they trust, who they associate with based on reputation and go from there. I implore the council to increase outreach efforts to the state to destigmatize cannabis and educate state agencies, um, departments and law enforcement. Legislators are testifying on dated, unfounded information that's not true, not using the scientific method. Um, it's, it's proposing that association is causation, which is not true. And we don't want to see more people hurt by the false propaganda from the Nixon era. Mr. McCabe, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Benjamin Zacks is next. Hello? Yes. Hi, um, thank you for, for letting me in. Um, my name is Ben Zacks. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Fine Federal Dispensary. Fine Federal owns and operates three of the 18 medical dispensaries in Connecticut. We are three of the five of the 22 businesses that are still locally owned. Um, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you all to what you're doing. Your job is probably feels thankless sometimes and is incredibly difficult. No state or municipality has gotten social equity right. And um, you guys are really put in a position to, of, of incredible importance and we thank you for that. As a current medical dispensary looking to convert to hybrid, we like to think of social equity in, in sort of a pyramid with the bottom of the pyramid affecting the most people, which is funds to the areas that have been most disproportionately impacted and um, having a positive impact on those communities, which we hope the tax revenue does. In the middle is jobs. And for those jobs to be created in those disproportionate impact areas, two of which of our locations are in, um, we need to be able to start and begin hiring people to move um, and create those jobs and create careers and financial opportunities for people. And at the top is ownership. And generally, simply because businesses are harder to own and start, ownership is gonna be smaller, but that's where enormous impact can happen through these equity joint venture licenses and through new applications. We firmly do believe that the social equity lottery being flooded is really against the intent and, is, and represents a lot of money in an area where folks are supposed to be by definition um, with lower income and lower net worth to be able to have a true opportunity to win the license and not be a ping pong ball out of many, but a ping pong ball out of few. So we do hope you assess that. The other piece is starting and operating these businesses is expensive and hard. And we would love to be a resource in a sense for the equity council, for applicants, for job prospectees, for potential owners, for you guys to understand what does it mean to create a cannabis business that can lead towards success. And I hope that there can be a collaborative approach to ensure that we can move this market forward in a fair, equi equitable way with incredible access to this important plant, incredible opportunities for the American dream for equity applicants who are from Connecticut and um, truly build this industry uh, build this industry together because the current medical operators are the first impasse towards that happening. And we really can affect a large percentage of the work that's going to be done very soon. And so um, we hope um, we're happy to be a part of agendas. We're happy to speak. We're happy to connect and um, do whatever we can to move this forward in a way that makes sense. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Zaks. Jose Zabaleta. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for taking the time. I'm. Let me start by saying that it's that I applaud everyone, every single member of the council, and um, you know it's a hard job, um, and not not everyone is 
is made to uh, take the the hits and the the criticism, but you guys are are standing strong. So congratulations for that. Um, so hello, Madam Chair and Council Members. My name is Jose Zavalera. I am the lab director for Altasai Labs in New Britain, and as part of a minority-owned and operated small business, I know firsthand the struggle and sacrifices that are required to not only open, but operate the business on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Altasai has created numerous jobs here in the community, either directly or indirectly, and we've had to navigate uncharted space, just like you guys are on, on navigating uncharted space due to the fact that um, well, we were the very first regulated, um, not the very first lab ever, but the first lab to operate under regulation in the country to test cannabis. Um, so I, I completely understand where you guys are coming from. I'm here, however, to speak on the topic of unnecessary and unduly burdens and the potential of small businesses like microcultivators being held to a necessary standard. The DCP's recent proposal on microbiology limits was conducted vigorously and extensive due diligence was conducted. Multiple, multiple experts and non-stake, non-stake holders were consulted. The science is crystal clear on the safe limit for cannabis products. Let me say that again, the science is crystal clear on the safe limits for cannabis products, yet noisy counter arguments have been made and masked as advocating for patient safety. However, without providing a single science fact, experts, I'm, I'm saying it in plural, experts input or literature to back those arguments, imposing non-science backed limits on products would impose an unnecessary financial burden on a small business such as a microcultivator and future minority owned small businesses. To be more specific, to achieve extraordinarily low levels of natural, natural contamination that is common on flora like the, like the cannabis plant would require unduly high capital investment by the small business owner because Connecticut does not allow remediation even though 99% of programs in the country our neighbors, Massachusetts, New York, Vermont, allow remediation. It is a very possible and plausible for a small business to not only be able to meet an unnecessary standard that are not backed by any science and have to destroy that harvest and lose their business in a blink of an eye. I encourage this council to take that into consideration when ensuring that unduly burdens do not prohibit people that have been mostly affected by discriminatory drug laws especially as stated earlier by the council, black and brown folk to take Mr. advantage. Mr. Zavaleta, I'm sorry, your time is up, sir. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, Christina Ava Capitan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Christina Capitan. I am a Connecticut patient uh, and a cannabis consumer advocate. And I've been working, you know, within the, within the structure of the medical program and directly working with patients myself who have been adversely affected by the onslaught of corporate interests that have come into the state of Connecticut. Uh-oh, sorry, I had some feedback. <laughs> okay. Um, so... We have been outside of the state capital, and, and the main point that I'd like to make is that the first step that the state of Connecticut should have taken is not coming up with license structures and ways to you know fill in budget gaps, but to help heal and, and help make connections within this community between not only the advocates, but the people in the legislature, um, help try to destigmatize so that we could have those conversations and be a part of this process. Um, if we're not able to do that, um, because of the stigma and the hardships that we've already faced, a lot of the people that we're speaking to in this legislature and on these councils and things are the same people that have oppressed our community. So it makes it very, very hard to encourage somebody um, who has been incarcerated, who has been adversely affected and had their children taken um, to become a part of this legislative process, get involved. I've heard you say, and you know, I do want to appreciate that, you know, while we're outside the Capitol advocating, 
um, you guys must have been listening to us because you hit on several of the points that we have made outside that capital as some of the concerns that we have. But a lot of that, you know, is, is not just something to be said and wrote on paper, but to be put into action. Um, and, and that shouldn't happen after the state is gaining revenue and having this interest um, in something that they've criminalized our community and hurt our community for. Um, you know, medical cannabis is a part of equity. I've worked directly with these patients who are hurt by the war on drugs prior to becoming patients, and that has cost them an immense amount, a measurable amount of opportunity and peace and pursuit of happiness. And, you know, that, that has to be remembered when we're thinking about uh, who we're talking about here. Um, there was another point that I wanted to make, you know, you guys did touch on those issues. If it's written on paper and it's said out loud, but not put into action, um, that means nothing to our community. Um, you know, things like, oh, we're erasing the records of people from this state to this state, and, you know, it gets complicated and a little bit messy. Um, you're right, it does. And even cases on paper can't just be the only cases counted. People have taken uh, programs and been involved in the judicial system and taken pleas and things like that to other other charges, um, but you know th that immensely affected them. Um, currently, there are cases ongoing in the state of Connecticut in courts that are still ongoing, um, where they should just be dismissed and dropped for any quantity or intent um, of having cannabis. If you're saying now that the state can sell weed and make a profit and rev gain revenue, um, how can you then? pursue people for charges that associated with selling any amount of weed. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and I think Ms. those Capitan, are things that you have to focus on Ms. as the equity council. Ms. Thank Capitan, you. Capitan, your time is up. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Luis Vega. I do not see his name on the list. Okay. Jason Kavanaugh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Jason Kavanaugh. Um, I am a Mountainville resident um, and I've been listening to this uh, kind of confused because I felt that the aim of social equity was to lift up uh, the minority communities that have been affected by the war on drugs. And what I'm hearing is uh, flooding capital of uh, white owned businesses into this market, uh, you know, celebrating the, the amount of, of applications being higher than general applications is wrong. Because if this is not a slush fund, which is what it feels like today, um, then, then what is the reason for, for increasing the number of applications, right? Shouldn't we want there to be only minorities applying for these licenses, right? Because these are the people we're trying to, to uphold. But if we allow all of this other money to flood in and then we don't check the tax returns of these people, is there anything that stops me, for instance, as a uh, white person from starting 10 shell companies and ha having a different person run each of these 10 shell companies and grab two minorities to back and flood the market with, with millions of dollars in applications. Is there anything that stops me from owning the entire market? Is there any way for you to know that I own the entire market? You know, these background checks, it sounds like we want to keep the criminal element out, but we don't want to keep the white collar criminals out. The people who are hurting patients like me, you know, six months ago, I could barely breathe because of the mold issues in the medical system. I had to stop using the medicine that I was getting from the dispensaries because I couldn't breathe anymore. Now I use medicine from craft cultivators and now I can breathe again. So that's wrong. Perpetuating the system is wrong. And Jose from Alta Sai should be ashamed of himself because he's the person who went behind everybody's back and changed the rules through an email and made the levels higher, which hurts people like me 
Do you know how scary it is to not be able to breathe? And that's exactly what you're doing to these minority communities that you're a part of, is you're choking them out too. You're choking them out of a market that they belong to, a community that they are a part of, that they are a vibrant part of. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Circling back to Luis Vega. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, good morning. Um, I'd like to, my name is Luis Vega. Um, I'm in North Haven, Connecticut, uh, 49 Quinnipiac Ave, North Haven, Connecticut. I'm a hemp farmer in the state as well as a hemp producer. Um, I was directly affected by the war on drugs when I was arrested uh, for cannabis cultivation in Hamden, Connecticut, uh, where I was convicted um, eight times. So, you know, that study that shows that multiple convictions on one docket is, is what he's kind of talking about there. So I have eight convictions for cannabis um, in the state of Connecticut. Uh, so the options and the hurdles were, were pretty much stacked against all of us and everybody out said that spoke earlier. So blessings on them for the, for the words that they spoke there. So there were some options that we had to go into here. We could either do a section 149 license where you own your business and you find some type of funding or you can take an EJV. So I didn't go down the EJV route. I've been a business owner in the state in the cannabis space for the last seven ish years here. Um, starting with investing in medical marijuana certification centers and then moving into becoming a hemp farmer in the state because that was the avenue that I could take at the time with my uh, background and now hopefully moving into a space where hemp farmers were not given that that priority and there was a lot of things stacked in front of us so you guys didn't control those rules but those were the rules that came down so we took the avenue that we can get there so I went in and got myself a big 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 loan from some financing so with that we now see that there's access to capital through CT Innovations in the seven-figure range for out-of-state companies. I'm an in-state individual willing to put in way more than somebody from out-of-state would be doing. I'm offering more jobs as a cannabis cultivator versus a food and manufacturing cultivator. And I didn't have any access to or information to this information that was going out there. And there was seven figures awarded, not just me, but to anybody else in the state. So as somebody that's from Connecticut, directly impacted by the war on drugs, somebody that has qualified, hopefully, for a Section 149, which we haven't heard any information about at all. So I, I, I don't have bags and bags and bags of money and everything that it costs to go into here is, is crazy to also not hear any update about the Section 149 or the EJV. Like, it, and I appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Like, you were handed a workload that you didn't have any say over. You guys are all voluntary. I get that. This is a huge plate. Appreciate everything that you guys are doing, but there's just these, the, the, the financing and the talk of capital so many times and to see a seven figure investment go to an out of state company when there's so many people who are moving through the space in the way that you're asking us to is really harsh. Um, Mr. Thank Vega. you very much. Thank you. Finally, Kyla Schaefer. I should say last but not least. Hello. Yes, hello. Hello, my name is Kyla Schaefer. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Mansfield. Um, and I am a Connecticut um, medical marijuana patient. Um, I just want to say that having a lottery and having any sort of caps is really unjust and it is not a social equality at all. The numbers show it's just totally unfair. It's unjust. It makes the small craft cannabis gifter, they have a zero chance to... Um, hurts me and they have a zero chance to ever get a license. It hurts me, the patient, it hurts the legacy market, the vendor, which they want to do the right thing and give taxes, give everything. 
Um, because patients like me, the legacy market has helped. I have Crohn's disease. I have severe Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. I've had cancer. I have autoimmune disease. So having the moldy corporate cannabis that supposedly what I was told has been sprayed and remediated and made into better medicine. As far as I know that like, if you have a moldy tomato plant, you throw that out. You don't try to like rectify it. You just, so it's the same, should be the same for the medicine. And having the social equality cap or having a lottery at all, it just hurts the brown and black. It hurts everybody in our state. It does not help anybody. There is a way that we could all work together. I can say that I don't trust the corporate cannabis mold. And I would rather take a 50-50 Gantz on a legacy market and maybe know all the information, maybe know none information about what I am receiving as a gift. But in that case, I would rather take a 50-50 chance and get halfway good medicine, whereas I know I take 100% chance with corporate and get mold. And it's really bad for me. It's bad for everybody else in the state. And I mean, there's people that say they're sick over it, people going to the emergency room. And nobody does anything. And these people, like he just said, he should be able to be getting some of that money. That money should not be going out of state. And, and, and having an out-of-state person getting a social equality license and in any way, shape, or form, it should be people like him that's been convicted six times or five or whatever his number was. And then now wants to be a hemp farmer in our state. He should be allowed. And people like that are true social equality candidates that should be allowed in our state. And there should be patient advocacy. There is no patient advocacy on any of the boards, whether it be social equality, whether it be DCP. And the only way to get a hold of anybody is email. Email, you never get anything back. Nobody ever responds. So that's like talking Ms. Schaefer. to Yep, your time you. is up. Thank you. All right. Thank you for everything, guys. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. This concludes our public speaking portion. Um, I, if there is no nothing for the good of the order, I will. And oh yes, Councilwoman Shaw. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, forgive me. I uh, reviewed the minutes that have already been accepted. And if it's appropriate, I just have one uh, observation. You, the, the minutes accurately reflect that you presented the finance report on my behalf. Um, the minutes also appropriately reflect that I was present for the majority of the meeting, but I was late. So um, there is a reference to you presenting the report because I was not at the meeting. And if that part, um, that mistaken reference could be eliminated, um, that would make them more accurate. Sure, we can definitely update that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? All righty, I will um, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a second? Second. Great, thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, see you everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, it's over.